heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with light from above into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came Took of the offer of grace he did proper. He saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to Heaven came down and glory filled my soul, filled my soul. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Riches eternal and blessings supernal from his precious hand I receive. Sing it now. sit down and greet someone this morning this evening that's what it is we can do that we don't usually do it but hey shaking hands with people howdy there Robin. howdy ma'am howdy sir hello to you probably on the phone. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Usually you get those phone calls and you don't get to see anybody. <laughs> Glad you came. Howdy. That's good. Valerie's next. Are you singing with her? Are you just playing? We have a special tonight, Valerie. She's special every night, isn't that right, Mike? Anything else I can say to help you out?
can't read lips. You're like talking to my wife. You don't read lips. I do. It must be a women thing. You know, I don't know. My wife will sit down there and go, <laughs> for years I've endured this, you know. I finally said, just don't tell me. Just stand up and say it. <laughs> we can only take so much, ladies. I want you to know that. Then, <laughs> then we're done. Let's stand again. <laughs> Thelma, come on now. Let's stand together. One more song. 518 in your hymn books if you want to use it. <coughs> Who is on the Lord's side? I am. Amen. Yeah. You're using your hymn book. This is the first, third, and last. One, three, and four. Love to sit. Is he going to let us sit down or not? Oh. Open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians tonight. Thank you for playing for me. That's someplace in the New Testament. I just haven't found it yet. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. Last few weeks, last month or so, we've been looking at the armor of God and the importance of it, and that's where we're at today. Spiritual warfare is very important for us to understand. Why? Well, it says, beginning at verse 10, and it'll be on the screen. You can look up there, too, but if you're like me, I like to have it in my hand. That's, that's kind of what I like to have. I was talking to Mike a little bit ago, and he was talking about he's going to get a Bible instead of using his phone. When you use your phone all the time, it's good, but you don't see the context of the verses. You know, you have about six or seven verses there, but you don't know what's in front of it or what's behind it. Not that I'm picking on anybody for using your phones, you know, but you need to have a Bible. It really helps out a lot. Verse 10, finally, my brethren, so he's talking to Christians here, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. As we take a few minutes just to review what we've looked at in the past, you need to remember that we... We're fighting a battle, and the battle that we fight can't be fought with the weapons of man. It has to be fought in the power of God. That's where our victory is. 
and be able to fight that victory, you have to have an intimate personal relationship with God. That's what eternal life is. Again, according to John chapter 17, verse 3, this is life eternal. He defines it, that you might know thee, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So eternal life is having an intimacy with God. And the Bible tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen? Amen. And so the more of the Bible you know, the stronger you're going to be when it comes to doing the battle that God has called us to. That's why Paul tells us this. He says, be strong in the Lord, and that's how you become strong in the Lord. You have that knowledge of who he is. That relationship grows. But it also says, in the power of his might. Again, we always fight battles ourselves, or we try to fight battle ourselves. When difficult things come, we do everything we can, humanly speaking, to take care of that problem without ever taking it to the Lord. Does God care about the small things in your life as much as the big things in your life? Sure he does. So we need to to change our way of thinking and make him one of the priorities of our life in every aspect of our life. And so in the power of his might. And then he says, put on the whole armor of God. And we've talked about many of the pieces. We'll talk about them just in a second as we review a little bit. But you can't put on parts of the armor and do battle. It's all or nothing. And very few Christians, if I can put it this way, wake up in the morning and prepare themselves for the day. I'm not talking about what's coming as far as work or school, whatever comes. I'm talking about preparing yourself for the spiritual battles that await you. They're coming. Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for you. And I know that we're not really important people, but doesn't he have a vast army at his disposal also that can play havoc with our lives and our minds and things like this? And so you need to remember that you have to put on the whole armor of God and you have to prepare yourself. And one of the ways that you do that is to Take time to study the scriptures. We'll look at that today. But the scriptures are vitally important. You have to have that in your mind. I know I told Joe a while back, and I've shared it with you several different times. When you talk about the importance of the Bible, people will say, well, it's the, just a book. It's more than just a book. This is God's guideline for your life. His instruction manual, how you should run your life, that you might receive the glory that he wants you to have. And so put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? To stand, to stand. And that's important because in verse 11, verse 13, and verse 14, you find that concept, to stand. God expects us to stand in our our conflicts with the wicked, with the wicked one and also with his wicked host that comes with him. And so we ought to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Satan doesn't just use one track to try to get us off track. He has many wiles. That word wile simply means tricks or schemes that he uses. And let's face it, he knows you pretty good. He's been around you all the life that you've had. He knows the things that you said, different things. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. But he knows us pretty good, doesn't he? And he knows the things that can get us off track very easy. So remember, the only way that you can stand against the wiles of the devil is in the power of God, right? That's what it talks about. And the power of his might by putting on the armor of God. Let's go on. Verse 12 tells us why we need to have the armor of God. Why we have to put it on. Why we have to have the power of his might. And by the way, this is not your armor. This is God's armor. You know, the way that you put on God's armor is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible commands the Christian to be filled with the Spirit. There shouldn't be a time in our life when we're not filled. That word filled means to be controlled by the Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God fills us and controls us, we'll be doing the things that God desires us to do to bring glory to him. And so when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we're going to be more apt to have whose armor on, his or mine. I'm going to have his armor on. That way I'm going to be victorious in the spiritual warfare that I'm fighting. So we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But haven't you seen so many churches blow themselves out of the water fighting with each other? I've seen it many times as a pastor. And it's a shame. Because when that happens, you know who's behind it. And you know, if it's really hurting the church that we haven't put on the armor of God, we need to be prepared for what's coming because it is coming. Satan does not stop outside at the door. He comes on inside. You have to remember that. He's not just at a certain place. He's always around us wanting to catch us up and to trick us and to keep us from giving glory and honor to God. And so we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, against people, but we... We wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of (coughs) this age, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. That's our enemy. But, you know, I've been in churches where the pastor has become the enemy or the deacons have become the enemy. 
or whoever has become the enemy. I mean, it's sad, but that's what it is. The church is one of the only armies I know that, that kill its own wounded. Shouldn't be that way. So remember, this is God's plan of how we should do the battle that he's placed us in. Verse 13 says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Part of it? No, all of it. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. That's what I want to do. I want to withstand. You know, I'm not being moved. I'm fighting the fight. Satan's not going to move me. Withstanding that evil day and having done all to stand. And then he says, therefore, stand, having girded your waist with what? Truth. With truth. That's the first thing that we looked at, the belt of truth. And that's built on a life that is faithful to the word of God and faithful to the God of the word. Faithfulness. Is God faithful? Amen. Amen. He's always faithful. We need to understand who he is. And how do you learn who he is so you can be faithful to this God? Through the scriptures that you have on your lap. That's why it's so important. Faithfulness. Everything in the Christian life, all the armor that we have, revolves around the idea of him being truth. And the word of God is what helps us. Even when we get to we talk about the sword of the spirit, it tells us the sword of the spirit is the word of God. So the word of God permeates the entire weaponry of the armor that we put on so we can be victorious. The church is victorious. Remember, we've talked about it before. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus tells them that the gates of hell should not prevail against the church. Gates are a defensive mechanism. You know, we're battering down the gates of hell. That's what the church is doing. But boy, you wouldn't tell that from the church today, could you? It just seems like it's in reverse. And so we talked about, first of all, having girded your waist with truth. And may I suggest to you that kind of carries the concept of knowing who God is, and that begins with salvation. Then it says, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness carries the idea of living a holy life. This book will keep you from sin. Do you believe that? It's true. The more you know about this book, the, the holier life you're going to live. And we looked at it this morning in 1 Peter chapter 1 where it says, Be ye holy as I am holy. God has an expectation of you. You know what that is? To be holy. See, you guys are right there with me. And so we have to put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protected the heart and the major organs because back in those days, if you got shot in the gut, if we can use that expression, of course, they didn't have guns back in those days, took a spear or something like that in your gut, chances are you're going to die. So the breastplate would protect you. It doesn't talk about the back because we stand. We stand, and we're not, we're not showing our back to the enemy. We're standing against the enemy. We shall not be moved kind of a concept, you know, from you 60s people. You older hippies, if you're, go back to Lewisburg down there. They're, they're still hippies down there, lots of them. That's where they retire to. <laughs> Kid you not, brother. I, I'll take you down there and show you. But the idea here is to, to live your life in a holy way and, and being in conformity to God's word. And that's important because if you, if you don't live a holy life, you allow Satan a beachhead into your life. And once he has a beachhead into your life, it begins to spread like a cancer. It affects other parts of your life. And so you have to put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect you against what he wants to do. And that's just destroy your life. So put on the breastplate of righteousness that you might live a holy life. And then we talked about shotting your feet with the, the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shotting your feet. We talked about, of course, that carries the idea of taking the gospel to the world. And that's another area that the church has really faltered in considerably, wouldn't you say? We don't even witness in our own areas well enough in the world. We'll pay people. We'll pay people to be our missionaries all over the world, but you know, we'll give our money, but we don't give our time or our treasure so often. And so the idea, I think, is to be careful. God expects us, as we're shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, to take the gospel wherever we go. But the idea there is more than just taking the gospel that gives peace to people. I have peace because I know who I belong to. I've been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, and nothing can change that. No man could snatch me out of my Father's hand. Amen? Amen. And so I know who he is. On the, the high points of my life, I know who he is. You know, I won't be moved, I won't be shaken, I'll stand. In the low points of my life, I still know who he is, and I won't be shaken, and I know who I'm standing against. And so it's the idea of standing firm with the knowledge of who he is and what he's done for us. Amen? And we talked about the type of shoes the Romans wore with the little spikes so that, that you couldn't go backwards very well, but it would help you to stand. I don't know about you, but you have to realize that Warfare is not easy. It's painful many times. 
It's places that you don't want to go to. It's places you don't want to be. We're so often comfortable in our comfort zones, and we don't fight the fight because we just want to stay in our comfort zone. That's one of the wiles of the devil that he uses against us. And so we talked about the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16 says, above all, taking the shield of faith. The shield of faith. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. We get it from the Old Testament. It's brought up into the New Testament. That's what God expects us to live. In the good times and the bad times, we're living by faith, walking with him. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you always. Is that true? Amen. Is God real? Is he really? Yeah. If he is real, then why aren't we out there evangelizing and telling people about the love of Christ, telling people about hell that's coming for many people that aren't saved? If we really believe there was a God, we believe that there's a heaven. And we do believe that, but we'd also believe there's a hell that many people are going to. So when we say that we have faith, sometimes our faith is not the quite the, a grain of mustard seed. You know? He says if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, go, and it'll go. I'll take that kind of faith, wouldn't you? And we need to pray like the man who came to Jesus. What did he say? Lord, help my unbelief, our doubt. And we talked about the, the helmet of salvation. And we use the idea of the, a two-handed sword, you know, a broad sword with two sharp sides to it. When Satan attacks us, he attacks our minds with discouragement. You remember what the other one was? I failed as a teacher. <laughs> discouragement and who said that? Doubt. The more you know about the Bible, the less what you have? Doubts you have. Faith cometh by hearing by the word. Your faith increases. It grows as you know the scriptures. And Satan is good at being discouraged. We talked about that a lot last week. You know, one of the things I wrestle with that I shared with you is discouragement. In the past in my ministry, it's very easy to get discouraged. My son's very discouraged now in his ministry. But that's just part of what we have to do. But I have full assurance in my God. I have full assurance in the salvation that he's provided for me. And no matter what Satan throws at me, I won't be discouraged. And I won't doubt, because why? I know who he is. That doesn't mean I won't get down in the dumps at times and say, hey, this isn't any fun, because we're human, amen? amen. Most of us are. By looking out there, I think most of us are, except for you, Jimmy. I'm not sure where you stand. <laughs> I can say that to him. He puts up with me a lot. But we are engaged. <laughs> All right, brother. Sleep lightly tonight. <laughs> but Satan wants to take away the things that God has given to us. And that's why we have to fight the war. What's he given to us? Well, he's given us the truth of who he is, how he loves us. You know, when this doubts and discouragement, we, if God loved me, why am I going through this? You know, you know, if, if you know, I have cancer or something like that, you know, God, how can you allow this to happen to me if you love me? How can you do that to me? There again, Satan is sowing what in your mind? Doubts. You know, he's given us his church. He's given us his word, his spirit, his grace, his salvation, his blessing. He's given us eternal life. And again, eternal life isn't living forever. That's a fringe benefit of having it. You're going to get this right one of these days, aren't you? It's the idea of knowing him is what eternal life is. That's how Jesus defines it. But living forever in that concept is a fringe benefit of having that relationship with him. Can I get an amen from somebody? Amen. Oh, that's good. And so our enemy, and it's the devil, he doesn't want us to have anything that God has given to us. And he would do everything in his power to take away those things that God has given to us, those things that have blessed us, so they become of no earthly good to us. And that's how we have to do it. Because if we're going to stand and hold the precious ground that we have, the, the promises and blessings that we have, we have to put on the whole armor of God. Amen? Amen. And so we have to put on and be prepared. And verse 17 says, take the helmet of salvation, which we looked at. And then it says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And that's what I want to look at this evening. That was all introduction. And so we want to look at the sword of the Spirit. That's our offensive weapon. Amen? Yeah. It's an offensive weapon, but it's also a defensive weapon. And it also talks about prayer. I think that's also an offensive weapon that we have that we can use to do combat with Satan when he comes into our life. Because that's what we want to do. So let's begin by looking at the identity of, of the sword itself. In the Bible, there are two words that are used um, for sword. Usually when we think of, when we think of 
the sword of God, the sword of the Spirit. Let me go back here real quick and show you the picture that was at the beginning. You see the two-handed sword there, the broad sword? If you get online, you look up the sword of the Spirit, those are mostly what you see. That's a broad sword, and there, that word is used in the Bible to speak of a sword. But uh, that, that would be a picture of it there. I forgot I had that one. But there's another word in the Bible that's used for sword, and it's a small sword that hung off the Roman warrior's waist, off his belt of truth. And in the Bible, when it speaks of the sword of the spirit, it's not talking about the broad sword. That's a different word altogether. The word that's used here, it speaks of a, a short sword. Or if you're an American, it speaks of a Bowie knife. You know Jim Bowie in the Alamo, he had a knife about this long. It's a short sword. That's the idea, the type of sword that they, it was always there ready for them to do battle with when they had it. It was 6 to 18 inches long, and so it can be different lengths. It was called a gladius. You know, gladiators would carry them into battle, that sort of thing. And that's what Paul uses here to describe the sword of the Spirit. Not the, not the big sword that you think of when you think of the sword of the Spirit. He's talking about a small sword that the Roman soldiers carried on their waist. That's what's good about being able to look at some of the helps in the Bible to be able to determine exactly what he's speaking of there. And so Paul uses this second word, and he's thinking of a, sort, a sh short, there we go, short sword that's carried by every Roman soldier. So he was ready to use it. And by the way, it was a, the, same, the same weapon that Peter used to cut off the ear of Malchus, remember? The servant of the uh, high priest in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when James was martyred, it says that he was killed by the sword. You remember that? That's the same word. It's the small sword, not the big sword, that killed James. And so the short sword was an indispensable component of the Roman soldier's armor. He used it to defend himself, and he used it offensively as he fought in the battle. But it was also used for daily activities. You know, we think about preparing ourselves for battle, and it's only something that we, you know, comes up once in a while. You have to be ready all the time. You put the armor of God on all the time because you could use it any time. And the sword is always there with you. And what is the sword? The word of God. And let me just pause here for a minute. How many times I have told you about in Greenbrier, I knew several ladies that would come to church and they would take their Bibles and throw it in the back window of their car. And they would always have their Bible when they came to church, Dwayne. And it was awful nice of them. But, you know, it would bake in that car window. And after a while, it was this tall, you know, this thick. And they would have that. That tells me they're not really spending much time with what? Their word. The older we get, the more precious the Bible should become to us. That's why I like to come and say, hey, look what I found. This is really great. I found a great price on the Bible. Because it's, is there anything better than the Bible? It's the most precious thing you own is the word of God. And that's wonderful. And so here Paul has in mind not a physical sword. He's talking about a spiritual sword, the sword of the spirit. Sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now. Come on. The spiritual sword that he's talking about here is of the Lord. So it's not of us, right? It's the sword of the Spirit. And that refers to where it comes from. Where does it come from? The Spirit of God. Now remember, I know the Father had a lot to do with our salvation. The Son had a lot to do with our salvation. We forget about the Spirit. This weapon that we have comes directly from the Spirit of God to us. And so... He reminds us, because he said it is the word of God, that the Bible is not a man-made book. It isn't. The Bible is a supernatural book that comes to us from the Spirit of God. Do you believe that? The Bible says in 2 Timothy that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I love that, don't you? It means it's God-breathed. And the idea there, you take lung, you take air into your lungs, and you force it up over your vocal cords and over your teeth and your gums, your lips, and you make what? I try to make words. Sometimes I don't know what comes out, but the idea that you make words, right? You communicate. That's the idea. That's what God did. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. That's what He did. He breathed it out to us. So what we have in, in our Bibles, in the book that you have on your lap, is His Word. He is speaking to who? To you. And so all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, it's God breathed, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be what? Perfect. Hey, I like that. Any of you people perfect? But the Bible says the word of God is what? Glory is Lloyd perfect. Yeah, see, I thought so. Stick with me, Lloyd. You'll be okay. 
How was that fried chicken today? That was pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It comes from God, and we can be perfect. Perfect doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes. Perfect means that we're mature. You know, there is a time, Christian, in your life when God expects you to become mature. Not a little child drinking the milk of the word, but you're, you're digging into the deep things of God like we do on Wednesday night a little bit, getting into something a little bit deeper than what most people want to get into because that's important. It helps us to grow. And so we can become perfect, and we become imperfect. We become perfect from the word of God that he gives to us, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Why did God save us? For by grace are we saved through faith, and not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, or any man should boast. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what purpose? For good works, which he hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So the idea that we are to accomplish what God has set us out to do. And so the Bible that we have is God-breathed. It's, it's his word to us. It says in 2 Peter, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were what? Moved by the Holy Spirit. Carried along. It's like the wind filling the sails and carrying it along. That's what God did. And so our book that we have, written by 40 different authors, comes from God, the creator of all things, who can measure the universe, all that he's created in the span of his hand. This God has given you his word. There's nothing more precious than the book, the book that he's given to us. And so again, remember that the Bible that you have is not an ordinary book. It's the word of God. It's the inspired word. It's infallible. What's that mean? It's always right, isn't it? It's infallible. It can't be wrong. It's inerrant. The truth is always the truth. My Bible doesn't contain the word of God. My Bible is the word of God. And there's a difference in that thinking. I can trust my Bible. I can believe my Bible. And what does the Bible tell me? Well, it tells me who God is. Is that good? Yeah. It tells me who I am. It tells me where I came from. It tells me where I'm going. It tells me how to get to where I'm going. It gives me a, the identity of who God is. It tells me who the Creator is. It allows me to have an intimate relationship with Him. It tells me how to be saved. It helps me in all the battles that I fight. He sustains me in joy. He fills me with the joy that he gives to me. And I can walk in his spirit. I can walk in his presence all the time. And so it gives me wide an wise answers to questions that I might have. But to do that, I'd have to know what the Bible contains. I have to spend some time learning the scripture. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he said this, the Bible must have been written by God or good men or bad men or good angels or bad angels. I guess he covered a whole gamut there, didn't he? He says, but bad men and bad angels would not write it because it condemns bad men and bad angels. And good men and good angels would not deceive by lying about its authority and claiming that God wrote it. And so the Bible must have been written as it claims to have been written by God, who by his Holy Spirit inspired men to record his words using the human instrument to communicate his truth. I don't agree with all the things of Methodism, you know, but I do agree with what he's saying there. The Bible is too pure of a book to be man-made. And we could do a whole study on that idea, and I don't have the time to do it today. But the, the Bible is a book to be read. It's a book to be believed, a book to be loved, a book to be shared, a book to be enjoyed. <laughs> I enjoy reading my Bible. People say, I can't get into that. I can't read the Bible. I just I fall asleep. Well, don't pick it up at 12 o'clock at night and start reading it. You want to go to sleep? That's a great way to do it because you'll be gone in no time at all. But the Word of God has to saturate your life. Amen? And in the average Christian life, 98.99% of Christians, it doesn't saturate them. They get it on Sundays for a couple of hours. They might get it on Wednesday for a little bit. But let's face it, life is busy. And we get busy doing things, and we don't take time for the most important aspect of our life, and that's that relationship that we've been talking about with the God. And so when Paul speaks about the sword of the Spirit, he's referring to the, the Word of God. That's the identity. That's what it is. It's the Word of God. And so that's the identity of the sword. What's the importance of the sword? Well, in the Bible, there's actually four words that are used to speak of the idea of word. The first one is logos. You've heard that word before, haven't you? Yeah, I think you have. What's it say in John chapter 1? In the beginning was the word. That's the word that's used there, logos, for that. And that idea, the idea of logos carries the idea of, of, 
thought. It carries the idea of the meaning of the word, the spoken word. It carries the idea of the entirety of the word of God. But that's not the word that Paul uses here. He uses another word, and it's this one, Rima. We had a church down in Greenbrier called Rima. That's how I learned what the word was. I said, what is Rima? And that refers to the word too, but not the all-encompassing aspect of the word of God. It refers to specific words or specific phrases of the Bible. And that's why he uses it here. Because when we're in battle with Satan, you have to know the scriptures. You have to know the scriptures. For instance, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is in the wilderness. You know the story? He's in the wilderness being tempted by who? Our favorite person, the devil. And what does Jesus do as he combats Satan? He quotes the scripture to him. Does he quote the entire Bible to him? No, he doesn't. This is how he quotes it. I just give you the Old Testament quotes because he's going back into the Old Testament because they didn't have the what? The New Testament. So he humbled so he humbled you. That's what it says. Isn't that what it says? I'm trying to read that with my glasses on. Allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that, man, I better read it before I can see it. So he humbled you allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that men shall not live by bread alone, but by what? By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When Jesus combated the, the, the trial that Satan brought upon him, he didn't go all over the Bible or hand him the Bible or cast him out or whatever. He used the word of God to defeat him. That's why you have to know the scriptures. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 and 7, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6. You should not tempt the Lord your God. Does that sound familiar? And so here is God quoting what? The scriptures to Satan. Absolute truth. That's why you have to know. That that's why this is a sword. It's an offensive weapon. It does damage. And we're to have victory over the evil one. We talk about victory in Jesus, but most of us don't live in that victory. And then the last temptation that he had. He quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him. Period. So he's quoting the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's the idea of the word Rima. Jesus didn't rebuke Satan. He simply used the word of God as a sword to repel his attack. But to do that, you have to know where in the Bible to find the things to repel the attacks of Satan when they come. And so I think there's a lesson here for us. We, we need to be so familiar with the word of God that in it, it contains an armory that we can use against Satan. We need to know where all the swords in the Bible are placed. And when the enemy attacks us, we're able to repel his attacks because we know the word of God and we can use the word of God as a weapon. It doesn't do you any good in the back window of your car. It has to be something that I love to see a Bible that people have marked up and have read and it's fallen apart. That's terrible when they fall apart because you got all those marks in, all those years of, of study and marking and writing, and then you get a new Bible, Wayne, and what do you have to do? You're lost. I was just telling Jim a little bit ago that the, I got you, that the idea there is to, When I came here, I, I used it, before I came here, I used the King James Bible all the time. And I had my King James with all kinds of notes and sermon notes in it and stuff like that. And then when I came here, I had to use the new King James. You guys have really messed me up. But it's a better translation, I'll be honest with you. It really is, and so I'm glad that we have that. But you need to stand against the assaults, Satan's assaults, and so you have to know the Scriptures. And so the Bible is a defensive weapon, yes, but it's also an offensive weapon. It says... For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Therefore submit to God. So submit to God. And when you submit to God, you can resist the devil. And you, when you resist the devil, what happens? He flees from you. So how do you resist the devil? with the sword of the Spirit and the armor of God. Otherwise, you're not going to be victorious in your life as a Christian at all. And so when the Word of God is preached 
in the power of the Holy Spirit. It transforms lost sinners. This, this book is what brings salvation to people. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. This book brings dead things to life. You know that because you were dead in your trespasses and sin, and God raised you to life. Man, I was dead, but now I'm alive. And I'm alive because of this book. He brings people out of darkness into light. That was us. He sets us on the right path. We're saints. We're holy ones. He takes our sadness and turns it to joy. No matter what happens to our lives, no matter how the rug is pulled out, nothing affects my relationship to God. It's always the same, and I can praise Him constantly. And the more I know Him, the more I'm into that relationship with Him, that intimacy with Him, no matter what comes to my life, I can weather it. Because really I have known whom, I, I know who I have believed in. It's easy to say it, but it's a different thing to know it. Would you agree with that? It's true. The problem with many people in the church today is that they're simply not familiar enough with what God has said in his book. And so when the enemy attacks us, they resort to rebuking Satan or pleading the blood of Jesus or some other useless thing. I'm not saying the blood of Jesus is useless because it gives us life. It forgives us of our sins. But it doesn't do any good combating Satan. He says, use the sword of the Spirit. Amen? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. This rebu How can I rebuke Satan? I'm just a man and a sinful man at that. And he's a greater being than I am. And I'm going to say, get behind me, Satan. I can't speak for God. Can you? I don't know what God's going to do. You know, sometimes God allows things to happen in our life for a purpose and for a reason. I know he loves me. And I know nothing comes into my life unless he allows it to come into my life. But, you know, if I say, get behind me, Satan, and Satan doesn't get behind me, what am I going to start to do? I'm going to get discouraged, and I'm going to be doubting God. And that's the two main things that Satan uses against us. I'm so glad that I'm a child of God, cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing can take that away from me. But to do battle with Satan, that's what we're talking about here, doing battle with Satan, you have to use the word of God. You have to use the Word of God. If they knew where it was in the Scriptures, they wouldn't be helpless. You know, oh, I know what the Bible says. I know where that's at. It's in the Bible. Every people answer, you know, where do you find the virgin birth? Oh, it's in the Bible. Where do you find the idea of the substitutionary atonement? It's in the Bible. You know, a lot of times you get that answer from a lot of people. To be honest with you, you get that answer from a lot of people you wouldn't expect to get that answer from. I probably give you that answer sometimes, you know. But the idea there is to take some time and learn the Bible. Thomas Guthrie said this. I think I have it. He said, the Bible is an armory of heavenly weapons, a laboratory of infallible medicines, a mine of exhaustless wealth. It is a guidebook for every road, a chart for every sea, a medicine for every malady, and a balm for every wound. Rob us of our Bibles and our sky has lost its sound. People don't talk like that anymore. You know, you read some of the old things that old preachers wrote centuries ago. People just don't talk that way anymore. And that's a shame. And so remember, the Bible is the word of God. It's God breathed. It is the source of our faith and it's the source of our weapons. We learn everything we know about our faith through the scriptures. John MacArthur shares the following quote from a person by the name of H.P. Barber, and I thought it was neat as I was doing some study into the, the sermon tonight. He says, as I looked out into the garden one day, I saw three things. First, I saw a butterfly. The butterfly was beautiful, and it would alight on a flower, and then it would flutter to another flower, and then to another, and only for a second or two would it sit, and it would move on. It would touch as many lonely blossoms as it could, but derive absolutely no benefit from it. Then I watched a little longer out my window, and there came a botanist. And the botanist had a big notebook under his arm and a great big magnifying glass. And the botanist would lean over a certain flower, and he would look for a long time, and then he would write notes in his notebook. He was there for hours writing notes. He would close them, stick them under his arm, tuck his magnifying glass in his pocket, and walk away. The third thing I noticed was a bee, just a little bee. But the bee would light on a flower, and it would sink down deep into the flower, and it would extract all the nectar and pollen that it could carry. 
it went in empty every time, and it came out full. He writes, some Christians, like that butterfly, flit from Bible study to Bible study, from sermon to sermon, and from commentary to commentary, while gaining little more than a nice feeling and some good ideas. Others, like the botanists, study scripture carefully and take copious notes. They gain much information but little truth. Others, like the bee, go to the Bible to be taught by God and to grow in knowledge of him. Also, like the bee, they never go away empty. And then an anonymous writer wrote this. There are words written by kings, by emperors, by princes, by poets, by sages, by philosophers, by fishermen, by statesmen, by men learned in the wisdom of Egypt, educated in the schools of Babylon, and trained at the feet of the rabbis in Jerusalem. It was written by men, he's talking about the Bible. It was written by men in exile, in the desert, in shepherd's tents, in green pastures, and beside still waters. Among its authors, we find a tax gatherer, a herdsman, a gatherer of sycamore fruit. We find poor men, rich men, statesmen, preachers, captains, legislatures, and legislators, judges, and exiles. The Bible is a library full of history, genealogy, law, ethics, prophecy, poetry, eloquence, medicine, science, political economy, and the perfect rule for personal and social life. And behind every word of the Bible is the divine author, God himself. That's so true. So what do we do? What do we get from this sermon tonight? Well, you need to make the Bible your daily bread. I know a lot of people get the daily bread. And if you read the daily bread, God bless you. If you only read the daily bread, you have a problem. There's not enough meat there. It's just like having a grape when you could have a whole bag of grapes. It just doesn't, it just doesn't do it, does it, Joe? And so you have to make the Bible your daily bread. And if you do... When the enemy comes against you, and he's going to come against you, that's a, a guarantee thing. You'd be ready to stand. And that's what we want to do. And having done all, we'll still stand. And you have to do that with the armor of God. And so leave here tonight with a different attitude about the Bible that you have. It is your weapon. And so if we are defeated as a church, or if you're defeated as an individual, it's because we are not using the scriptures. We have victory in Jesus the church is on the offensive. We're moving down, tearing down the doors of hell. And there's people out there who need what? The gospel. And who's been entrusted with the gospel? As we said this morning, we are his ambassadors. Amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians 5. 10. We are his ambassadors. We need to implore people to do what? Accept Christ. And so there we have the sword of the Spirit. Learn it. Use it. And give your God glory as you defeat Satan. Amen? Because when you use it, he'll flee from you. That's what I like. Let's stand together. Thank you for coming. Is God good or what?